Imagine, if you will, that I'm something of a anti-religion type. Um, I'm not, but just you know, for the sake of this argument, that I have something against faith in general. Um, and let's say that I'm genuine. I honestly think that faith is, say, a bad thing, or uh, that it's dangerous, or something like that. Um, I'm not trolling people. I'm not just being a jerk. I, you know, when I speak out against religion, let's just say that I mean what I say. I'm not being deliberately disruptive. <laughs> now, with me, that's a bit of a stretch uh, <laughs> to say that I'm not being deliberately disru disruptive, but I'm counting on the viewer's imagination here. Um, so I don't like religion, and I think that it's a bad force in the world, but I want to be nice about it, um, and I want to end religion in the world. So I pack up a few placards and um, I head down, say, to, oh, I don't know, Chattanooga, Tennessee, or, um, say, Varanasi in India, the sort of the holiest city for the Hindus, or I go to Mecca or somehow, or whatever. And while I'm there, um, I just start preaching to the people who have gathered there um, just what rubbish it is that I believe that they believe. Um, I start telling people, say, in, uh, in Chattanooga that... Um, Jesus was just a human being and that he screwed up like everybody else and he wasn't the son of God and um, he was, uh, um, you know, just some guy who possibly was a schizophrenic or something who came and babbled incoherently uh, 2,000 years ago and uh, all you people who are here to sort of attend, say, a Southern Baptist convention or something are just deluded fools and I'm here to help you. And let's say that I mean this, okay? <laughs> let's say that I mean this. I'm sincere. I really do want to sort of disabuse these people of this notion that I think is stupid, okay? Uh, that they are, their minds, I believe, are enslaved to this idea. What's the reaction that I'm going to get? Um, I think a lot of people would simply look at me and go, Phew, oh, well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, buddy. And uh, walk away. And um, I, that would probably be what most people would do. Um, but, you know, if, if you're in a place where you really do not expect this, say, where people's behavior is carefully controlled, now, in, I think, in, say, in Chattanooga, you could probably hide behind various amendments of the U.S. Constitution and say, I'm not violating anybody's rights here to this, that, or the other, so too bad if you don't like it. But go to Mecca, say. But it, be nice, though, about it. Like, don't deliberately, you know, get obnoxious about it, but just sort of say, look, what you're believing is wrong, and here's why watch what happens, or in Varanasi, or somewhere where um, faith is a very living, breathing, obvious thing that is intertwined with the law and everything like that, that it has legal sanction placed upon it. Uh, thinking, say, of the case of Mecca, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, Varanasi, say, in, in India, and you start speaking against Hinduism in Hindu's holiest city, well, I don't think the police would do anything, but they might arrest you for your own protection. But the crowd might tear you limb from limb. <laughs> um, not nice, eh? Now, examine what happened there. I go to Mecca and I start preaching to the local people how I think Islam is a dumb idea and that, you know, they, they would be better off without it. What do you expect? How, how do you expect people to react to that? Um, it doesn't matter what my intentions are. We, we know what's going to happen. Like we, we know that I'm going to. It's not going to end well for me. Uh, and and I'm also going to sort of rub an awful lot of people a lo a, the wrong way. And and sincerely, they will be rubbed the wrong way. It's not as if they would be looking for an excuse to get angry with me. This, this would put their noses out of joint. Um, they weren't expecting to see this weird foreigner in Mecca preaching against Islam while they were there trying to, you know, engage in the Hajj or faith activities or whatever. They wanted to have their faith affirmed, have a very positive experience. And they show up and here's me telling them that the whole thing is a pile of hooey. How are they going to react? Um, interesting, that's that's how, you know, sort of communication works, doesn't it? It doesn't matter what your intentions are often times. It depends on what's in the head of the person who's on the receiving end of whatever it is you're attempting to communicate. As I say, I go to Chattanooga and I start saying that, you know, 
Jesus this and you know he was a bonehead and just some guy who was probably on drugs or something spewing this nonsense 2,000 years ago and I, I mean this and I'm trying to you know, sort of help people to explain this to them well they're gonna hear something very different <laughs> they're gonna hear something that they value being debased by somebody who doesn't seem to care how important it is to them um, never mind what you know the, the what I actually mean to say how are they gonna hear it um, you know you, you hear a lot of uh, stuff lately about how certain faiths are spreading you hear the one that you hear mostly is Islam a lot of people would see that as a good thing a lot of people see that as a threat what's the difference where what's the dividing line you know wh why is it some people sort of see well it's just an inevitable product of the dynamics of modern society that uh, you know we should all get in each other's faces with communication being what it is and transportation being much more uh, efficient than it's ever been etc etc it's just going to happen it doesn't really have any value placed on it whereas other people see it as a menace some people in say closed society societies traditional sort of closed societies see the internet as a menace to the social order a menace to everything really uh, other people see, say, immigration or the mass movement of people in the world as just a inevitable outgrowth of the way society has changed. Again, communication, transportation, etc. Other people see it as a as a conspiracy, as a conquest or whatever. Um, you know, Eurabia, that kind of thing. I spoke. I, I made a video a couple of days ago that I thought was fairly innocuous. I honestly did, and it caused <laughs> a couple of people to get pretty cheesed off with me. Now, how do you account for that? Say, in particular, how do you account for that in a deterministic universe? Think about that. I have the desire to do something. It doesn't matter whether or not that desire was determined or not. I have the desire. I have the desire to express my views, okay? And one would assume I have the desire to be interpreted correctly. <laughs> uh, but other people, when they hear what I have to say, put their own spin on it just by the act of listening to me. Um, they decide what I'm actually doing. Um, the case of, like the obvious case, let's say, I, I somehow sneak into Mecca as a non-Muslim and start telling all these Muslim people how dumb they are for believing what they believe. Um, okay, I don't think any Muslim could reasonably be expected to be prepared for that sort of thing, to greet him when he gets off the plane to do the Hajj. Some idiot telling him that all his religion is foolishness. So what's, how's he going to react? He's going to see that as something profoundly unpleasant, perhaps a threat, perhaps uh, uh, even a symptom that society has gone completely insane and that the world is on its last legs. If you have people preaching atheism in Mecca, you can be pretty much assured that some people, is going, some people are going to assume that that is proof positive that the world has started to collapse, that the world has started to go straight to hell. Whereas all I've done is I'm just trying to tell these people what I think. You're going to get an eruption. What makes the difference? What causes this? I have goodwill, let's say, and I don't want to—I don't want to disturb anybody. I want to talk these people out of their what I believe is a silly religion. <clears throat> I want to help them. They, all that they want, is to sort of not be disturbed by these sorts of things because this is neither the time nor the place for it, and maybe they don't believe that it's ever the time or the place to hear such things. Um, what is it that causes something fairly innocuous to erupt? And it gets right down to why do we have things in our society like politeness, like uh, restraint? Why do we have things like um, concern for the feelings of others? Why do we even care? I think it's a function of the fact that we understand that um, desire, what we expect to see, informs everything. Um, a lot of people sort of note that, say, Americans and Canadians are not sort of as obviously demonstratively polite as say the English are um, we don't we don't mean to offend anybody by it but you know we're just offhand when we do things and you know we speak our minds and shoot from the hip and stuff like this and I think to say someone from England um, especially say from the south um, might sort of go Ooh, this, this fellow is so coarse I, I don't I don't really I don't have anything against him but I don't know you know this kind of thing is my 
attempt at a Kent accent, but anyway, not very good at it. Um, why? Because he lives in England where everybody is living cheek by jowl and they've evolved these elaborate sort of unwritten rules of conduct to enable people not to clash into each other. Um, but here's me, big mouth, mouthing off, and uh, it just sort of, you know, bothers him that I'm like this, you know, being coarse and colonial and everything in a um, nice uh, inn in Kent or something like this. So w we have those things because we know that people are going to place value on every last thing that we ever do. Um, whatever you think of, say, religion, you would think that it's a pretty stupid thing and pretty coarse and obnoxious thing to do, or most people would, to go to Chattanooga and start telling everybody that, that you think Jesus was insane and stupid and their whole religion is garbage. Not a smart thing to do, not a nice thing to do. And if somebody flattens your nose while you're doing it, well, okay, I don't agree with the fact that the guy punched you in the face, but come on, you must have known that that that's what could happen if you did this sort of thing. Or if you went to Mecca and did what I said you could do. Let's say you got killed. I don't think anybody would be particularly surprised by that. Or if you got condemned to have your head lopped off, which I don't think would happen. But let's just, you know, a lot of people would say, well, come on, what do you expect the Saudis to do to this guy? Okay, you know, most of the world's non-Muslims would even say, okay, yeah, but I don't agree with capital punishment and killing people for saying the wrong things. But look what this bonehead did. <laughs> he went to Mecca and started blaspheming against Islam. He's going to get retaliated against, what, whatever you think about it. Why is that? Why do we know that people are going to react that way? Why do I know that when I, say if I was to get onto the Internet and say something massively unpopular, that I'm going to get an awful lot of, you know, thumbs down <laughs> and more than just that? Because I know that regardless of my intention, people's desires are going to alter what I say. I might say something with a certain idea in my head, but the very fact that they are listening to me and perceiving what I'm saying is going to alter it. Um, all that I'm doing is, say if I, you know, again, I go to Mecca and start blaspheming. All that I'm doing is I'm speaking my mind, and I might be doing so sincerely. But what other people hear is they hear all kinds of other things. As I say, I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people sort of... <coughs> there, I sneezed into my sleeve. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some people saw that, as, as, as I say, as some sort of evidence that the world was going straight to hell and that we're in some sort of crisis mode, that this is what the world has come to. But how does that square with what's in my head when I'm telling these people that your religion is foolishness? All I'm doing is I'm trying to help this guy get out of what I believe is the darkness that he's in. And he sees me as an existential threat to not just to him, but to the cosmic order, the way of things. What's the difference there? Desire. <laughs> um, what do you want and what do you fear? What do you expect to hear? And, um, what, uh, and how are you going to interpret what happens around you? The causal chain is just a pile of events blindly happening uh, in a deterministic universe. There's no intent behind anything ever. None. There can't be. Everything is a reaction to what goes on before. I'm going back to it again. Indulge me. I'm sitting in a car that's going forward driving. I'm sitting in the back seat and I'm turned around and I'm looking through the rear window. I'm seeing the world go that way. That's how you see the universe in a determined uh, context, in a deterministic universe. You're looking backwards from the backseat of a moving car and reality is going by you this way. That's determinism. Desire is when you turn around, look over the driver's shoulder through the windshield and you see things as they come at you. That's desire. Determinism is simply about what has happened. Desire is about what may happen, or interpretations for what, on what has happened. You can look back, say, if you're sitting in the back seat again, looking through the rear window as the world recedes, 
you can look back on that and place value on it and sort of say, this, 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 and this indicates that when I look through the windshield, I'm going to see horrible things. Or I'm going to see good things. This, 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 and this. I look at the past and I use it to judge what's ahead. What is that, though? That's desire. Um, all that's happening, say if I'm looking back through the rear window, is the world is going by. Nothing really, ha there's not really any value because all of this is now in the past and none of this really means anything anymore. It's beyond my control. But I'm going to place value on it. And the interesting thing is, not only will, am I going to place value on what has already happened, even in a deterministic universe, I'm going to use, I'm going to extrapolate from the value that I place on that what is probably ahead of me when I look through the windshield on what's coming. You have desire altering just about every perception you ever have. Um, it doesn't matter if the universe is blind mechanics. I want the universe to be a certain way. I want things to happen a certain way. And when they don't happen a certain way, I react to that. You can say that my reaction is determined. I get it. I understand that. But you can't say that my desire that I believe has been affected that I'm reacting to, that can't be determined. Because desire doesn't work like that. I have to want the world to be a certain way. Something happens. I'm a Muslim. I'm going to do the Hajj. I get off the plane. I see some bonehead preaching against Islam. I was not expecting this. I was expecting a nice spiritual um, event. I didn't want this to happen, and it's going to upset me that this guy has done this. It might upset me profoundly that I'm meeting this idiot with, you know, some placard saying something very offensive, maybe with a spit roasted pig on it or something like this just for added emphasis I don't want to live in a world that is like that why not if the world is just completely deterministic what does it matter if the world is like this or not ah because I want the world to be a certain way it's like Seneca's view you know what's it um, Vedius Polio believed in a world in which glasses didn't get broken we want things to be a certain way. And when things don't turn out that way, we react. Or if when things too do turn out that way, we, we react as well. This is all based upon desire. Our actual physical reactions may be determined, and the possibilities that we choose to react are maybe determined. I don't know. But the desire is what motivates the entire thing. The desire motivates reaction in and of itself. I get off the plane, I'm just getting down, I'm in Jeddah, I'm ready to go to Mecca, and I see an idiot standing there blaspheming against, um, against Islam. I'm going to get mad. You can say I was determined to do this, and my, my, the number of actions that I could have done were limited down to just one by the circumstances around me. I get it. You can argue that. You can't argue the desire that motivates the entire thing. Um, you can make people do all kinds of things. You can't make them care. 